others. But if you continue to show up and if you continue to be you, you will get there. But if you hide, man, if you pull the pin because you've been burnt in the past, whether it's love, relationship, so you go, right here, I've been burnt too many times, I'm not going to come to the starting line, well, then, mate, you're never going to find it. I suppose for me, when I, when I work with the kids, when I'm trying to teach them, is that you've got to bring your best effort, and your best effort sometimes might not be good enough. But if you can get to the point where you can handle your best effort not being good enough, then you are on because then the next time that you could bring it and it just might be but if you go and give your best effort just once and it's not good enough and then you pull back well then you're never going to find it man because you're not giving your all all righty g'day g'day welcome back to another episode of a lot to talk about it is your boy the captain of the ship the man in charge bradley j driver of course you can call me brad blessed to be here today i'm with a guy who could arguably be the best storyteller to ever come on this podcast. The energy, the way he communicates it, the substance of the story is it is everything that you're going to experience today, essentially, whether you're watching or listening to the show. He's a man of, of many talents. He's a bit of a jack of all trades. He is a former AFL player. He spent a time living with a headhunting tribe in Borneo, which I'm sure we'll get into. He's one of the the incredible speakers at the Resilience Project with so many people here down under will know and love. Um, he's a man that they call Rack, um, but ladies and gentlemen, he's more affectionately known as Martin Heppel. So from your heart, home, your car, or wherever you are, give a very warm intro to the man himself. How are you, brother? Good, thank you. Good, bro. How are you, mate? Mate, I'm very good. Very excited to have you on. Very I appreciate excited. Your time. Appreciate your time. Mate, it's a pleasure. I was saying to you just before we hit record that the first time I come across your story was on the Imperfects podcast. Um, obviously, a fellow colleague, Hugh Van Cullenberg and, and the boys over there, Josh and Ryan, done an incredible job of sharing your story, where you come from. And if I'm correct in saying it was a Vulnerability House episode first, which then led to an Academy of Imperfection episode. I think, yeah, I'm not. I should know the actual titles. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you're right. I think you yeah, know what well, the vulnerability was. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I apologise. I, I haven't listened to either of them. I'm not really in there. Mate, when you, like, for all the listeners right now, when you hear this voice, you don't want to hear it ever again. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that was, I think it was that, in that order, those two. Yeah. Mate, well, I was really moved by both of those episodes. And firstly, I want to commend you on the work that you're doing. But um, I know you're not here for compliments. You're here to share your story. So I want to dive into it, mate. Like obviously childhood plays a really big part of, of who we are. I look back on my childhood all the time and, and recently have been reflecting on it quite a bit as I'm doing a bit of writing at the moment. And as I look back, I was, I was going through an exercise where I recalled my earliest childhood memory. And I remember a day that was just for me, just like the most amazing, beautiful experience was just mowing the lawns with my old man. I was pushing a fake one. He had the real one, <laughs> sweating it up in the overalls, a stripy hat. Um, and just like being next to my dad, feeling like I was of value, feeling like I was of service, going inside to a salmon and beetroot sandwich that mum had made, which is my favorite, her putting it in front of me, give me a kiss on the forehead and just feeling loved and appreciated. And as I sit there and look at all of those things and feelings that come within that moment, I realize that they're all the things that I'm searching for in life as a man now at 26. And, you know, you realize that the childhood and the experience you have in your early years, are, you know, is the context that shapes the man you eventually become. And whether that's a, a counteraction to that experience or whether that is, um, you know, you going on and living a very similar path, I think it's always quite interesting. So I'd, I'd love to hear about your childhood. Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, yeah, my, my, so my, my dad is English, my mum's American, and um, my mum and dad, my dad was a, was a, a chartered accountant originally, and he was working for IBM in, in London, and he got to the point where he hated it, and instead of, um, and it was, it was, I suppose, hard for him because my, my, um, my mother is, um, her father was an ambassador for the UK, so he was born in Jersey, as in the British Isles, so he would refer to himself as Jersey French, he wouldn't refer to himself as English, even though he was an ambassador for the UK. And so my dad had, um, I suppose he went through the churn of trying to please everyone, you know, and so he, he was trying to please, you know, um, his, at that stage, his fiance, his parents, having a good job and earning good coin and all that crap. 
and um, and then he said stuff and I'm done. I don't like it. So he went and studied anthropology. So he did anthropology, which is studying the culture of human beings. And um, he then said to my mother uh, in the late 1960s, let's go and live with the headhunting tribe. So that's what they did. And they, they went to Borneo, which is, you know, if, in, if you don't know where it is, just Google it. But it's, it's part of it belongs to Malaysia, part of it, Brunei, Indonesia. They um, went and lived with the Iban, the Iban are Dayaks and the headhunters. Um, and then in the Malaysia's part, uh, about 10 hours up river from Kuching in Sarawak. So mum and dad lived with them for about three years and they're bloody headhunters. So they don't muck around, mate. And, um, and the irony of it all is that whilst they were living with them, they said to themselves, these people are the kindest people we've ever met, which is <laughs> how they came to that at that stage, but that's what they did. And they said, if we have kids, we're going to bring up our kids with this tribe. So uh, my brother and I were born and um, and we grew up with the headhunting tribe. So we grew up in Borneo and basically pivoted back and forth between there and, and then dad had to come to, came to Australia because he was, his studies were being sponsored by um, ANU in Canberra, but then we kept on going back to Borneo. So grew up in Borneo and mate, had the time of life. It was it was unreal. Uh, I look back on it and there's, as you said, like it, when you when you look back on all these lessons that you learned, you didn't learn them at the time, but when yeah. you get older, you reflect on it, you go, oh, there was a lesson. There was another sure. one. Yeah, all that. So, you know, so we would go hunting for wild boar with, you know, blow pipes, you know, so, you know, you know, with, I don't know if you know what a blow pipe is, but, you know, with a dart in the middle. Yeah, I don't have one at home, but. <laughs> <laughs> so we, my dad does. We go out the back and it's oh, the target. No word of a lie. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, you know, and, you know, fishing and you know, living off the land and, and we were the outsiders because, you know, they'd never seen Anglo-Saxons before my mum and my dad. And then my brother and I were born when we were young. We had really sandy sort of white hair. And, um, and um, but they embraced us for who we were, you know, mm. and they, they accepted us. And we couldn't speak the language initially. But, you know, over time, you learned certain words. My mum and dad could speak it pretty fluently by the end of it. But, um, yeah, grew up there until about, probably about, Oh, I went to an international school in Jakarta for in my primary school years. So I was in, yeah. in Jakarta for a number of years, went to an international school called um, JIS, which is Jakarta International School, and then came back to Melbourne when I was in year eight and went to a private school in Melbourne, went to a school called Kerry. And, mate, again, outsiders. Like I'd, I'd grown up with headhunters. I'm not giving people grief, but everyone was driving Beamers and Mercedes and Rolls. Mm. And we drove a Holden Kingswood, which, um, you know, had 14 different colours on it because it'd been beaten up and everyone called it the Flintstones with Bill because if you got in the back of the car, you had to keep your feet up, otherwise you'd drag it <laughs> on the ground because there was no bloody floor. <laughs> it, was, mate, it was no Ray Worthies, man. And um, it, it was funny, like, I look back on it now and, like, I was so embarrassed by that car because you just want to fit in when you're a kid, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, just want to be the same as everyone else. So we go to a party and I'd tell my mum, drop me off 15 Ks down the road, I'll walk the <laughs> you know, and, and she'd come and pick us up and deliberately stall it in front of everyone. And yeah. I'd be crouching down in my seat. But now I wish I had the car, not because I want to, you know, redo, you know, do it up or, you know, and be worth anything, just because it had character, it had soul. For sure. It had glory. That, that's, that car had so many bloody stories, man. It was one time we had... We had these two Vietnamese friends, they were twins, Chu and yeah. Ta, legends. And mum went round a roundabout and we were playing corners and we went round the roundabout and Chu, one of the Vietnamese kids, superstar, he went straight through the door like went out. <laughs> and my mum, ice cool, like so ice cool. She didn't stop. She just kept on going, did a full circle and then came back to where he was, stopped the car, oh. picked him up the room and we kept on going. Mate, that's the best. That's the best. <laughs> oh, right, legendary. So, um, oh. yeah, so that was, that was, um, and then, you know, and then stayed, we, we, we still go back to Borneo, mm. but um, when I was at high school, at, it, we stayed in Melbourne um, until the end. So my childhood was spent just, you know, I suppose, observing different mm. cultures, different lifestyles. Um, and in that moment, I suppose, embrace and understand that we're all different. That would, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter where you're from or I'm from. We've all got a different story, but to respect it. But it also taught me how to take risks um, and to adapt and to be willing to fail because you were quite often put in situations where you, you were the outsider. And, and 
and it was okay to be uncomfortable. I think that was a big one that I learned. It was, it was, in, it's okay to be uncomfortable because you get through it. And yeah, you know, I remember going to a school that was um, nearby where you had to sort of walk for probably about a couple of hours, and then all the different villages came to one place. And there would have been about 150 people in this school, and you're all in one room. And, um, and mate, I couldn't understand the language, and and all the other tribes they weren't living with us, mm. so they were looking at me going, "Who's this bloke?" And everyone's just staring at you, like flat yeah. staring at you. And I can't communicate, and it was uncomfortable, but you get through it. And um, I, I learned so many wonderful things. And mate, if you had, if you said to me, "Go back and relive your childhood." I do it every single day in a heartbeat. And I had bad days, without doubt I had bad days. But um, those bad days enabled me to really cherish the good ones and to celebrate them and to know that when I have another bad one, that you'll get through it. It might take longer than others, but um, you will get through it if you stay positive and if you look towards um, the things that you can do rather than focus on what you can't and have a bit of optimism, a bit of hope, you know, then you're on. Mate, I love that so much. And there's something that stood out to me there, aside from all of the laughs. And, mate, you're, you're such an easy guest because you can literally just throw your question and you roll with it. I love it. Um, but the one thing that stood out to me there was you said the lessons that you learned at the time were obviously profound, but you don't recognize them in the moment. And I've been reflecting on that a lot. Like the listeners of the show will know my story, but for context here, you know, when I was three weeks old, my parents were sat in a doctor's surgery. And that doctor said to my parents that your son would be better off with a terminal illness. He, you know, cystic fibrosis will ruin his life. Mm -hmm. And they got up and walked out of that room. And when I reflect on that moment, I think that's the greatest lesson I could have ever learned in life. And I didn't know it at the time that what you believe is what you'll become. Mm -hmm. And that's something that has stuck with me. Like they believe that my life would be bigger than that, that it wasn't going to be another sad statistic, or I wasn't going to be the prisoner of a hospital bed. And ultimately their belief has led to me leading the life that I live now. And I look at your childhood and I think how many lessons are wrapped up in that incredibly unique experience. But I wonder at what point for you did it click? Like you said, you still felt that little bit of embarrassment, that little bit of, um, I guess, feeling like you're an outsider, like you weren't like the people back in Melbourne who were driving the Beamers and the Audis, you know, who would live that very, I guess, institutionalized life up until that point. At what point in your childhood or even in your adulthood did it click to you that oh, I need to embrace exactly what it was that I experienced? I think I think for me it would have been it was gradual. And the biggest I think my biggest strength, and it can be a weakness as well, or is my my passion, but then it's also being comfortable in your own skin. So mm. I think without doubt there were times when I would when I'd have some moments where I'd have maybe i suppose i'd go i'd be worried about not being able to sort of belong and to a group and whatnot but at the end of the day i think all those experiences they enable me to become more and more comfortable in my own skin and be who you are so for me being in, in borneo and, and with the headhunters just be who you are man you can't change the way you look um you, you can adapt and change your, your habits and the way you view things and your ability to be positive and have a crack at things. But at the end of the day, your morals and your values, which were ingrained in me from the day dot, they're the ones you've got to go back to. So I might, you know, you know, pivot sometimes from that, but then I've got to have the courage to reflect and look in the mirror and go, hey man, that was a poor effort. That wasn't with your morals and your values. You've got to get back to that, man. Get back to that. So, and then being, I suppose, you know, kind of yourself where what I did in that moment, that was a poor choice, poor behaviour, but I'm not a poor bloke. I'm not a bad bloke. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I'm not a crap, shit truck, whatever you want to refer to it. So for me, it was um, it was, it was was gradual and every experience then, I suppose, almost like the energy bar on your phone, it, it was recharging, it was getting higher and higher and higher, becoming more and more comfortable in your skin. Like for me, like going against the grain is something that I'm, I'm I don't do deliberately, but I'm I'm okay with doing. I'm proud yeah. to do that. You got and for many people that's the hardest thing to do. And I think for my childhood, those were the things. Is it okay to go and to go against the grain? If that's the right thing to do, if you need to stand up, you know, if it's a kid being bullied and you're not the one being bullied, man, you go against the grain. No one else is going to stand up for that kid. Yeah, you go and stand toe to toe with them, and you say, hey, mate, it doesn't matter if it's this kid or another kid. 
that's not on. You want to have a crack? Let's have a crack. But hey, we're not doing that today with that person standing on their own because I'm standing with them. So I think it was yeah. about all those all those experiences. It was about voice. It was about being proud of who you are. It was about recognising there's another human being who they have every single I suppose, opportunity um, to be proud to who they are as well. You might not like the way they roll every single day of the week, but you've got to be there for them. Yeah, and um, so for me, I think those lessons, when I when I look back on it, it was all, it was incremental, and I couldn't define point to one exact moment, but they all enabled me to be, keep, continue to grow and to be that person who was eventually okay to be who you were. like. You know, when I was at Cary, kids would come around to my house, our uh, house, and my 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 mum and dad would collect artifacts. So artifacts, all the carvings, all the weavings, all the um, you know, the swords, the blowpipes that the e-bomb would would make. And um, the, it, the, the uh, mum and dad's house is a bloody museum. Like you walk in there and you think there's some weird stuff going on. Like I had one mate stay the night the first time in year nine, and he, he was busting to go to the toilet at around about two a.m. I didn't know I was fast asleep, but he, he couldn't go back to sleep. He didn't go to the toilet till the sun came up because he thought if he did, all these voodoo curses were going to come and get him in the middle of the night because my dad had all these masks yeah. all on the hall, and he was just scared out of his mind. So I, I, I started to embrace it, and and. and it's my identity yeah mm. and so it's about knowing who you are where you're from and um and being okay with that and i'm okay with it i'm, I'm proud of it i don't go around walking in you know i don't go up to people when i first meet them and say hey mate i live with head others i don't go there but you, yeah. you and i are talking about it because you know a bit of my background so we go there but um for me it's i suppose it enabled me to to, to continually grow but when it really consolidated for me, I reckon would have been, I reckon in my early twenties for me. So yeah. all those lessons were growing, but in my early twenties, when I was playing AFL footy, um, I wasn't good. I, I didn't play many games, but that was the biggest one when I when I went down to a club and I, I witnessed where adult males were trying to fit in as opposed to belonging. So fitting in is when you go down to the footy club, you walk into the change rooms and other people would be doing stuff. And even though you wouldn't normally do it, you'd start doing it because that's what the masses were doing. You just yeah. want to jump in line, yeah? Belonging is, I rock on up to the footy club and I'm going to be me. And I hope you accept me for being me. But in turn, yeah. because you accept me for me, I'm going to accept you. Yeah, Mate, that's a beautiful you know way of explaining it. Fitting yeah, in so, versus belonging. Yeah. Yeah, and so for me, when I was at when I was at St Kilda in Melbourne, like, and this is no disrespect to any of the boys, but I would, and I'm not saying I was better than it because I'm sure there were times when I did try and fit in without doubt. But when you're going through that, we get that, this alpha male mass of, you know, 50 blokes in one area, you, um, if you're not strong enough, you start to follow. And for me, it was like, well, there's certain things I'm not going to follow and I'm going to be my own man. And that could have been detrimental to me in terms of like, I was stupid, man. I was, I've never smoked marijuana in my life. And, and, mate, I'm telling you, everyone who wants to sell gear, they always see me in the street. They come to me first, right? But I've never touched it. I've got nothing against man. Hey, everyone do what you want to do. I'm just not into it, right? Yeah. So, which is, but when I was at, at, at um, St Kilda, I'd turn up with it. I love Adidas Originals, yeah? And I'd, yeah. I'd wear an Addy Hash top. Like, mate, how stupid <laughs> I am. And I had long hair with dreads almost and beads. Mate, yeah. I, was, I was the walking profile of Bob Marley, right? <laughs> And and for some reason, they thought that I was smoking marijuana. Which, <laughs> mate, when I reflect on it, Stone Cold guarantee he did. But yeah. I didn't. But, so, but I'd, I'd, I'd continue to be me. That's what I like to wear. That's what I do. And, and sometimes you suffer the consequences and you have to learn from it. But I suppose, yeah, it was, it was, I think it's, but it's forever still the case now. You don't ever, I don't think you ever, for me, there's no destination. Like, mm. I'm not arriving at a destination that I'm complete. Like, man, I'm going to go forwards, I'm going to go backwards, I'm going to go sideways. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. It's going to yeah. rock me sometimes, you know what I mean? Um, so, but, yeah, I mean, I think it, it started early on. It continued to build, but it really consolidated pretty in my early 20s. Mate, I love that. And I love that analogy of fitting in versus belonging. And, you know, I wonder, you're, you're a father now, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, so how do you, obviously you've had a very unique left of center experience. I wonder what your words of encouragement or maybe words of somewhat advice would be to the people out there who are 
parents or maybe the people who are just trying to figure out how they embrace that idea of belonging. And yeah. because for me, I, I, I look at that and I look at unique personalities and I feel like the world has, the world has given people a reason to believe that as a unique belonging, you either find yourself um, as at the top tier as like an artist or a musician or someone who the world embraces for being different. Or if that isn't your path, you become someone at the bottom of the pile who's kind of seen as that outsider you spoke of feeling like at a point in time, but it's the wrong way to look at it because I love what you're saying. But how do you encourage people to start looking at belonging, being themselves, embracing exactly who they are, and getting comfortable with the fact that not everyone is going to love that? Yeah, I, I think well, like for my kids, so I've got a seven, uh, that's five, so a seven-year-old, a five-year-old in a couple of weeks, and a two-year-old. I, I, I'm just forever saying, um, you know, you just be you. And, and we'll love you no matter who that is. I think I think the one hard thing is the following. What I say to myself is this. I'm not after pats on the backs, adulation like that. Um, at the end of the day, like for me, that if I, if someone thinks I'm a flog or a wanker, well, then they, they're a pretty good judge of character. But at the end of the day, mate, what do you want me to do about it? So yeah. for me, it's it comes back to this. It comes back to what my wife thinks about me, what my kids think about me, what my parents think about me and my crew. Yeah. Anyone else? Do I respect them? Without doubt. I'm not out to offend anyone. But if you don't rate me, then what do you want me to do about it? And I suppose, so my message to my kids is that they're just going to be them. Now, mm. and that won't necessarily be embraced by all every single day. But if they follow their heart, if they're true to themselves, if they go and chase their passion, then it will be there. They'll find it. Now, sometimes it'll take longer than others. But if you continue to show up and if you continue to be you, you will get there. But if you hide, man, if you pull the pin because you've been burnt in the past, whether it's love, relationship, so you go, right, yeah, I've been burnt too many times. I'm not going to come to the starting line. Well, then, mate, you're never going to find it. I suppose for me, when I, when I work with the kids, what I'm trying to teach them is that you've got to bring your best effort and your best effort sometimes might not be good enough. But if you can get to the point where you can handle your best effort not being good enough, then you are on. Because then the next time, man, you could bring it and it just might be. But if you go and give your best effort just once and it's not good enough and then you pull back, well, then you're never going to find it, man, because you're not giving your all. So it's oh, about right, opening it up. So if I, like when I work with adults, you know, with, I suppose, even with, with, with adults, but with adolescent teens, what I see a lot of the time is that they don't want to go all in because if all in is all in, it's not up to it, then they feel like their identity, they feel like their, I don't know, whoever they may be, it's taking a hit. I don't want to be exposed mm. to not being good enough. I am okay not being good enough. But if I want to get better, I will. Now, the only way I'm going to get better is if I go all in and then I find out where I'm lacking and then I've got the courage to walk away and make amendments and address it. And I might not be able to. It might be something that's not attainable for me, yeah? But if I don't go all in there, man, how the hell do I know? So for my kids, it's just full throttle. You know, show respect yeah. to other human beings, display empathy, yeah? Listen, be kind to other people. That's how we develop relationships, yeah? Be there for them. Never burn your mates. Never, ever, ever burn your mates, yeah? Like if they are asking for your help, you are there in a heartbeat. You do not let them down. And if you do that, then, mate, that bond, that sense of belonging is there forever. You know, so for my mates, I hope out of my heart they know that I've got their back and they know that no matter what happens, shit, it's a fan, I'm there. Now, if it goes down and it's something that I don't agree with, then I will tell them about that and we'll talk about it. And if they reflect on that and they put their hand up and they say, you know what, it was a mo it was a lapse, it was poor form, but I'm, that's not me, then I've still got their back. Now, if they go down a path and they stay on that path, right, and, and it's continued, they'll go, hey, mate, we're done. Mate, we're done yeah. here. And I hope that if that was me, they would do the same to me. But if I do stuff up, and I put my hand up and say, you know what, that was really poor behaviour, but that's not really me. I need to make amends. Then I reckon they'll have my back too. So for our kids, 
if they can have that bond, that relationship, no matter who it is with, and it continually grows, and they are consistent with their actions in terms of being there for others, then hopefully the others will be there for them. And they could get burnt. That can happen in life. But that's the external factor you can't control. I can't control if one of my mates burns me. I'll be flat about it, but I can't control it. If they want to be done with me, they're done with me. Yeah? Mate, but more often not, they're not. This is just a masterclass in the essence of being a good human, like being an authentic human, because everything you said there, I, I agree with so much. And I love how you said you, you have that conversation and you build that self-esteem with your kids. And I think it's the same. I actually said this on a podcast last week. I feel as though as human beings, we have a responsibility to be kind and encourage authenticity. Like, I think it's really easy, like you said before, just to be a follower or fall victim to the pack mentality. But as soon as you like, as soon as you open up and you get authentic with mates and people around you, you actually create, create an environment that becomes comfortable for you to be more authentic too. And for me, like, so I'll give you a great example, right? Last, last week, last Thursday, I had the opportunity to go on a really good podcast as a guest now, mate, I've just been floating around, feeling great, feeling fit, feeling happy. And then morning of the podcast, I wake up and the fucking Everest of pimples has popped up on my face. And it's like, mate, it's, it's honestly like fucking add it to the fucking 14 peaks. There's now 15. <laughs> like, I'm like, fucking hell, you're kidding. Morning of the podcast. Great opportunity for me to go on and share my story. And I'm now terrified. I'm like, if I jump on this podcast and show my face, are the world going to think, what would a bloke with a pimple like that know about life? Right? So you start to create this little narrative in your head and you're like, yeah. I really want to show off all my confidence and just shell away here. And I'm yeah. like, but how stupid would that be? Because I would miss an opportunity to show up. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm going to show up. I'm going to embrace it. And I'm going to take the power away from the situation by pointing out that pimple at the first opportunity that I get on camera. Yeah. So I point out the pimple. And the chat's great. Literally have one of the best chats I've ever had on a podcast. I felt great. I felt like I really got my story across. But then coming here today, the pimple gets worse, right? And right now it's kind of hiding behind the mic. You'll be able to see it there. That's all right, mate. What you should have done is gone on that podcast and just let up. Was it face to face? Yeah. Was it, mate, I would have leant forward and just got it and squeezed the living daylight out of it and watch that pus just nail the other person smack bang in the forehead and just say to them, hey, how lucky are you to be blessed uh, by my pass? <laughs> <laughs> but, mate, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that, I mean, hey, I mean, well, I can't, I've got a pimple that's called my head. Like, I, mean, I can't do anything about my head, man. So, yeah, I mean, I hear, like, but, I mean, but that is it, isn't it? It's about being general. And I suppose the way we connect is through, like, what you're just doing then. Like, you talked about, you know, before about the imperfects and whatnot, mm. whoever it may be. But, like, we are flawed, and that's how we do connect. Like, when, when I'm, I, like if, if something embarrassing happens to me, I cannot wait to ring my mates. Like, I'm yeah. hanging on. Like, I'm just, I'm dying in, man. Like, yeah. as soon as I'm, like, trying to get out of there, go boom, 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 and I'm just ringing them <laughs> up, boys. Yeah. Like, I mean, the same thing, like, like I had, um, I, I don't know what your listeners are in terms of age, but I'm 48, right? So I'm a yeah. grandpa. But anyway, had some issues with my guts. Had, so I went and got a colonoscopy, right? So colonoscopy, you know, if you don't know what it, it is. Really laugh. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, but I mean, it's going to be great. But anyway, yeah. they're flashing me, mate. They're flashing me out. Yeah. Flash, flash, flash. So yeah. Laxatives going off tap. And um, and I, I get vertigo um, a fair bit every now and then. So I go to a chiropractor, and she's a, she's an absolute legend. And you know where it's going. So I'm in the chiro. She goes, bring your knees up to your stomach. And as soon as you did, vumba, like, I'm talking monster, just ex like huge, like bang. Anyway, and so I'm looking at it, and I'm speaking at 300 miles an hour. Man, going, I'm, cr oh, I'm George, I'm so sorry. I, I had a colonoscopy. I've been feeling like this. I'll be doing this. And she's like, what have you done? <laughs> It's okay. It's okay, Martin. This happens all the time. And I'm looking at her going, this does not happen all the time, Georgia. And so then I stood up and I got up, I'm walking out of the car and there's these two other girls in there, young girls, like in their 20s. And they, they can't make eye contact. They're looking at the ground, like staring at the ground. And then I go, I go to Maggie, who's the lady behind the till. And I'm trying to pay for the Cairo, and mate, and I've got I've got no coin in, my, in, in this account with the car. So I'm tapping. I'm going, you kidding me? So I get my phone out. I'm switching numbers, 
and, my, and I've floored this whole joint. It's a nuclear missile, right? Windows <laughs> open, doors open. Let's just get some flesh in, man. And I walked out of there, and I, I felt like, like I was at, like I was a, a tenth of the enemy. So then, Mate. got in the car, started laughing, and then all I did, I just started speed dialing. And I was just ringing up every single one of my mates. Now, part of the reason I was ringing them was oh. to have a laugh without doubt. Mm. The other half of it was to go to hear from them, hey, mate, you're human. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's a reminder. So <laughs> if you can get to the point where you can, you can, and I'm not saying, I, 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 you know, I said to her the next time I went in there, hey, the goal of this session is to keep my butt cheek <laughs> clenched. And thankfully, since then, it hasn't happened yeah. again. So no, I'm not going to do it. It's a little bit disrespectful, I'll be saying, if you do it deliberately. But um, but made it happen. I can't do anything about it. So yeah. I suppose for our kids is that what and with kids as well when they're growing up and what we all crave quite often is status, you know. And yeah. whether that be, you know, I mean, and depends on you know what everyone does and what they do. Whether it's status within the group, whether it be on social media, whether it be I don't know podcasts, whatever it may be. Um, we all crave the status, so we're worried about what other people think, yeah. And um, for me, and I'm guilty of that in the past, but mm. um, I suppose for me, what I do is now I, I just I remove myself, so I'm not on Facebook, I don't have an Instagram account. Um, we connected on over LinkedIn, but I, that's about it, I'm not on there very often. So for me, it's about removing the external voices that I can't control. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, and be you, but mate, I, I hear you, and you're gonna get another pimple. But you know what? I, I'd be saying to you, if someone judges you for having a pimple and they don't rate you, then I'd be saying to you, it's a good day for you because you just found out they're a flog. Because if anyone's gonna judge me on materialism or the way I look or something like that, and that's the way they roll, then I'm cool with that, man. Yeah. You roll differently to me, and I'm not rolling with you. But if you want to judge me on my ticker, on my heart, my soul, whether I'm going to turn up for you regularly, whether I'm going to care about other people, well, then, mate, we're in the hood, and I'll hang out with you day in, day out. But if it's not that way for you, and you don't like the way I roll, then I'm okay with us not hanging out. Mate, beautifully said, and mate, only you. Mr. Martin Heppel could take a story about shitting yourself at the chiropractor's and hey, no, 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 but it was a nightmare. Mate, that's a giggle. Bloody nightmare. Mate, that's a giggle. Um, but but honestly, so beautifully said. And I couldn't agree with that more. I think the sooner we get to that place as a society where we all embrace that more often and become comfortable with that, the better the world is. So, mate, you, you said it perfectly. There's something that stood out to me, which I really want to bring up. So you asked before about the age of the listener. And the age of the listener on this podcast is heavily between 18 and 34. But most of the people are in their 20s, right? Yeah. And for me, the twenties is a very formative part of adulthood because you go through this transition of coming out of high school and you've kind of been pushed into somewhat of a path that you think you should take. You start to realize whether that path is for you or not. And for a lot of people, it isn't. Um, I was one of those people. You then battle with the the idea that you're supposed to then find the love of your life. You're supposed to you know, start looking to buy a home. You're supposed to settle into what life is going to look like for the next 60 years until you pass. And this is the foundation of it, right? And for me, I, I got to a space in my early 20s where I found a career I was what I would like to consider quite good at in real estate. And the path was linear. Every year I earned a little bit more money. Every year I got a little bit better at my job. It moved me down to Melbourne for a while. It brought me back to the gong. I started to become more successful and tick off all of these goals. And all of a sudden I'm like, well, in the next couple of years, I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to own that nice house. I'm going to drive that Beamer. You know, the future kids will go to a good school. But all of a sudden, this idea or this plan that I built started to feel like a whole lot of emptiness, unfulfillment. Um, there was no understanding of purpose or connection to a path that actually gave my life meaning. I wasn't happy. I was waking up, you know, miserable, going to work, crying in my car. And I'm like, hold on. This isn't what life is supposed to look like. And then I had to make a huge change. At 24, I quit my job. 
I went broke because I didn't have any income. I had to sell my apartment. And for the last two and a half years, I've made absolutely fuck all money. But I've recorded 140 odd episodes of a podcast that brings me absolute joy. I get to stand on stage and connect with people over my story. I'm running marathons for a charity that means the world to me. And my life has never been better. And people embrace me for that. But there was definitely a feeling at this point in time, which I heard you describe in your Imperfects episode, where you said you got to this stage in your late 20s where as you come back from Borneo for that um, that period of time and you weren't in the AFL anymore, you looked around and all of your mates had partners. They had kids, they bought, they bought properties, they had materialistic things to show off and you felt like you'd missed out, you'd been left behind. Describe to me that period of time and that feeling and what it was that allowed you to then embrace the spot, the position you were at in life and go, nah, this is me and I'm fucking moving forward and doing my thing. Yeah, um, mate, it's, yeah, it's spot on, man. And, and I enjoyed listening to your you know, story then. It was awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, like, like, this is the whole thing about it. Like, you, can, I, I'm coming from my own skin, but don't, like, we all get rocked, right? Mm. We all get rocked. And so for me, I, I came back from overseas and, um, and I, so what happened was I finished up playing footy, was done with that, and that was my identity. Yeah, and when I say identity, I'd go out and everyone would go, how's footy going, how's footy going, how's footy going? When footy was going well, I experienced positive emotions. But when it was going ordinary, you experienced negative emotions, yeah? So then I went overseas and, um, and you know, I was backpacking as well for three and a half years and whatnot, came back, and as you said, so for me, I, the best piece of advice that I've ever got in my life that I'd go back to is was from my mum and I don't even reckon she knew what she was saying when she was she, it was it was broad the vice. It wasn't about one specific thing, but she said it doesn't matter when you find it as long as you find it. Right? So what it was for me was that, hey man, don't worry what other people think. If you're gonna be living at home for a couple of you know months because you haven't got any coin with your parents and you're 28, 29, and anyone thinks, mate, what are you doing? Well, then stuff them. All my crew had my back, but there were times when I got rocked, without doubt. I had girls break up with me because they said to me things such as, you know, I don't know what you can do for me in the future financially and stuff like that, which I'm cool with, man. Like, and legit, mate, if that's the way you want to roll, that's the way you want to roll. But at the same time, you, your inner voice is going, oh, man, well, well is she right? You know, is this the way it's going to be for me? But I kept on being, but then I'd get in a hole, but then I'd come back to self-talk. Hey, man, get back to who you are. Just get back to who you are. And I was lucky because for me, I got back to who I was. And, and I, I see life as being, it, it's some bad days, but I, I want an adventure and I want to have fun. You know what I mean? Like if I go and catch up with people, I don't want to necessarily talk about work all night. If people want to talk about it, I'm cool with it, but I want to talk about shit. And when I say shit, I mean good stories. I'm not here to do anything other than to talk shit and laugh because that's what I want to do. Let's have some fun. You want to be serious? I'll be serious. All right? Mm. So, but right now, let's have some fun, man. So for me, fun is everything and anything. It's sliding the mud. You know, it's going out in the rain and going down hillside. It could be whatever it is for anyone. But for me, fun was getting back to being a kid. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a young kid at heart. You know, you know, and so, I'm, and you know, people like they they hear that they, when they say I'm 48, they go, "My God, the bloke's only 22," and I, my wife would say I'm only 14, right? <laughs> mentally anyway. But um, so for me, it was just like, man, what do you enjoy doing? And I and I enjoy I enjoy um being humble and, and, and getting on the level with with kids and and just having fun, man. So I started working with kids and I loved it. It was awesome. And, um, I, you know, and I really, they taught me as much as I taught them. And um, and so I got back to it. And then I suppose it gave me more confidence to keep going for it, to keep going for it. I didn't get my full, first full-time job till I was 32. Now, obviously, I, you know, I did every other job. Like, yeah. You know, and, and, you know, shit-kicking jobs on the way, man. Like, And the shit-kicking jobs were good because they, they made me realise, hey, dude, if you want to do a job that you actually cherish and you want to do, then you're going to put some time and effort into it. Yeah, nothing cut you got hard yakka, man. You want something, it's not gift wrapped to you, you're not entitled. You've got to earn it. 
So I went back and did primary school teaching for four years from, you know, 28 to 32 and everyone else was younger than me and, you know, they're all looking at me probably going, you're a grandpa and I remember even saying to the people at the university that I was younger than what I actually was at the start because I was so worried about not fitting in and um, and then started doing primary school teaching when I was 32, man, I was a grade one, two teacher and mate, loved it. I, I, every, I could tell you every kid that I taught. I could, could, man. Every kid that I taught, I that. And, and, and one, two, and five, six, had them for a little bit, and I'd die from in a heartbeat. So for those four years doing that, and then four years doing the assistant principal stuff, it just, it reminded me about I.O. I.O., because I had the best childhood. Don't get me wrong, I had some trauma, right? And I had some heavy stuff go down, but I had the best childhood. I'd go relive my trauma and everything else with it because it's enabled me to become who I am. Yeah. And I owe every kid that I have had the privilege of being trusted to be able to teach support because someone, many, many adults gave it to me. They gave me the opportunity to have fun, to live, to be you, to grow up and just roll, man, and to keep presenting that. yourself. And so, so for me, that uh, that 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 churn was definitely there but i think what got me through was the, the simple words of it doesn't matter when you find it as long as you find it but what that was clear to me was what, what you got to find is what's right for you not what's right for someone else not what's mm -hmm. right for, not what, what's right for someone telling you this is what you should be doing it's mate if you're not ready you're not ready so go through the churn and slowly but surely you'll get there. So for me, it was trying different jobs, it was trying different things, doing different courses, and knowing that it might be the answer, it might not be the answer. Yeah. It's like it's like when I it's like my mates when we're, when we're twenty. Well, you go out, you know, when you go out, you try and pick up. <laughs> Mate, now back in the now this is back when there's no there's no Tinder, all right. Yeah. So it's not swipe. This is back where you had to go out and you know and actually have a crack on the dance floor. Yeah. Right. So every time you go out and you try and pick up, you never pick up, man. You never would, because everyone would see yeah. you. They'd see my head one, and go, no, thank you. But two, they see you with a safari hat and a shotgun. You're on the prowl, man. <laughs> everyone knows you're on the prowl. So they're looking at you, going, no, man. But you, 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 you only pick up when you yeah. trip over. You know what I mean? You know, you weren't even looking for it. It just happens, man. Mm. So for me. I just, I, I couldn't go out and try like in life to find what I was doing as if I was trying to pick up. That wasn't yeah. going to work because, mate, I, I'm wanting it too bad. I had to relax. I had to have faith in myself that it was going to take time to see it through, but slowly but surely believe that it will, that will, that will happen, that you'll trip over it. And for me, it was primary school teaching. I tripped over it. It was, yeah. I didn't know it. I, I started working with kids on school camps. I enjoyed it and I said, right, let's go to the primary school teaching. So for everyone out there, man, just just breathe. Just breathe. You're not supposed to you're not supposed to have it sorted. And and when you do, you won't even know that you do. Yeah. But yeah. and and the journey of you getting there is all right. And the ones who truly love you, I just hope I hope for all of you that they give you the space and the time to let you be you. Yeah, let you be you. And I know that's hard. I know it's hard when you've got parents telling you you've got to be doing this and that. But, mate, just be you, man, and you'll get there. It just takes time. For sure. And and like you said, when you are being you and those things click, like for me, there is no greater joy than doing what I do right now. Like I could work seven days a week doing what I do, and I'd love yeah. every second of it. Like it's the best. Yeah, it's like, awesome. We I get do. fucking amped to get up and like on a podcast day, I'm fucking bouncing around. Like I'm singing behind the mic while I'm setting things up. Like I'm just pumped up to be here. And then when you meet those people in your life, like when you create that circle of people who are there because you are you, like those relationships are, are never better. Like when oh, you mate, find it's the best. Person, yeah, it's the it's, best. Yeah, you, you walk in a room and all the people that you love are in that room. Mate, you're on. It's like, this is why like, when people get married, they go, it's the best day of my life. Bloody oath it was, mate. You had all your mates there. Like, mm -hmm. just do it again. Like, get them yeah. wide, mate. Just yeah. you don't have to get married. Just <laughs> get all your mates yeah. in the room again, and you're going to go bunter, man, because you are walking in there. And you sleep, you're like, when I see my mates, I lose my mind. One, because, you know, we're, we're older, you know, and we've got kids. When I see them, I'm like, yes! Like, I'm not here. <laughs> 
to walking a curb. And there you go. I'm like, oh, dude, we are on. Like, strap yourself in. We are going hard tonight because we haven't seen each other so long. And let's just start laughing. And yeah. that is wicked. And you get you don't get those moments that often. So when you do, man, cash in. For sure. Cash For sure. In. Mate, tell me, when you first met your partner, which yeah. is, am I right in saying Jan? Yeah, Jan. Yeah. Jan. Um, when you first met Jan, was it radical honesty from the start? She, did she get Martin the yeah, rat? She did. Yeah. Yeah. did she get everything <laughs> in the first go? She um well yeah, she did. Yeah, like okay. I told I told her a story about when I was in Japan um with the police and it was <laughs> And she was like, well, m- my view on it is this, is that, hey, man, if you can handle me, and, I, hey, and don't get me wrong, there's no lineup to be with me, all right? There's none. I was so lucky to meet Jen. So I'm not saying it like that. But my view is, hey, this is who I am. So let's get let's get straight there because if you can't handle it, then I'm cool with that and I respect that. But you need to know what you're walking into. So That's for true. me, I mean, it wasn't all. But, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an open book. I mean, and I mean, man, I liked it. Yeah, at the start, I still like it now. <laughs> but like at the start, like the very, I mean, we, we met, we met at a bar. I was at a wedding, came to the bar. She was at the bar. She was, she was walking around. We started chin wagging. I got her in a cab, paid the cabbie 20 bucks to get her home. Didn't hear from her. I got a phone number. This is you know, a long time ago, you know, a piece of or whatever. Um, and then rang her for three months, and she 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 couldn't remember who I was. And I was like, man, I, I like this girl because I I love punk rock music. She was in a punk rock music, so we're talking, you know, about that and hip hop and whatnot. And um, she finally relented. And then and then I said, right, yeah, we'll meet. And um, and the first time I met her was at the front of um. Oh, I've got to be careful here because I don't want to roll them. But at, at La Pochetta, you know, I don't know if you got La Pochetta, okay, yeah. yeah, pizza joint. She thought cheapskate, and I was like, no, no, that's just the place we'll meet, and then we'll go. And anyway, mate, yeah, but um, mate, I was lucky because she, um, she, out of anyone, or well, my mates do, and my family do, but out of anyone else I've ever met, she, um, she embraces for me, embraces me for all my flaws, and I've got so bloody many, and she puts up with my energy, um, and. Um, but there's parts of me that she does love and um, and I'm bloody lucky and I love her with every ounce of my heart. And um, so, but yeah, mate, like um, she takes the good with the bad. And, Ooh, and that's what love is, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And she gives me, she gives me feedback straight between the eyes. Well, and quite often it's just a look and I know, mm-hmm. hey, pop it down, pull your head in. Um, but um, I have, you know, the utmost, as anyone would, the utmost respect and um, and and love for her and admiration. And she is a bloody good human being, man. She's a bloody I good human that. being. Yeah. So beautifully so, said, mate. Look, you've obviously, you know, you're at a point now in your life where every time you stand on stage, every time you do a webinar, you have the power to to heavily impact the people in that room. Like there will be, you know, many people hopefully listening to this podcast today who are, you know, profoundly impacted by your story, the way that you tell it, um, the fact that humor is a beautiful way of sharing story and, you, and you're great at it. But there is a part of your story that is maybe a little bit more challenging for some people to hear. Um, and, you know, I had I had the privilege of being able to hear you share that um, very honestly and, you know, very vulnerably on the imperfects. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind touching on it here today. And yeah, no problem. Maybe just to give us a little trigger warning for anyone who might be, um, you know, a little bit hard. It might be a little bit hard for them to hear this. Yeah. So, so this involves basically. Um, I'm just changed my name to Martin rather than Elias. Is, is it like in before? So it, it basically. So it involves, I suppose, um, a bit of trauma when I was a kid. So for anyone um, who uh, has gone through some trauma as a kid involving adults, um, I'll probably leave it, you know, you know probably t- turn off now if it's going to be a trigger um, in terms of how adults treat you. But basically, I'm going to cut, and, I, and I'm A-OK sharing it, I've got no dramas with it. And 
I had in my heart, I've never lost an ounce of sleep over it. And I'll get to that in a moment because I think it's, I think it's an important message. But when I was in grade two, I was down at the park, um, late at about 8.30 at night, my brother and I and my mates would always go to the park and kick the footy. We were in Melbourne. So, um, and we could climb a tower, we'd climb the tower and turn the lights on. This time I was with one of my best mates, Caleb, and went to the tour behind a tree. And then out of nowhere, about 8.30 at night, there was this, this bloke standing right next to me. And, and then he, he, and he started touching me. And, um, and and touched me in places where I didn't want him to touch me. And I, that, and I couldn't, you know, when like everything gets sucked out of you, you got no air in your body. Yeah. And I was trying to scream, but I couldn't scream. I was like, what's going on here? This is weird. This is not nice. I don't like what you're doing to me. And um, he said, do you like this? You know, I can keep doing this. And um, I reckon you like this. And I'm sitting there in my head going, mate, I don't fucking like this at all. And then lucky enough for me, Kalen came around the corner, yelled out, and the bloke got spooked. He ran off. Um, and, mate, I was, um, I was a mess. So, but went home and told my mum and dad everything and told the police everything. And then um, and then we were away overseas. So at that, that stage, I was back in Melbourne for a short stint when it happened. Then we went overseas again, not because of that, just because um, that's the way we're rolling. And I came back when I was in year eight at Kerry. And my brother and I were walking our dogs. Um, we grew up in a suburb in Melbourne called Hawthorne. And we're walking the dogs in front of the primary school, which we went to as kids. And then this bloke turned up again. I'll never forget his head. And he came up to me. He goes, he just walked straight up to me. He started poking me in the chest. He goes, are you Martin Heppel? I was like, mate, what? He goes, are you Martin Heppel? My brother's about, I don't know, five minutes behind me. I was like, Mate, whatever happens here, Mal, do not, my brother's name's Mal, don't come over here and say why you're lying, because I was about to lie. And I was like, mate, I'm not Martin Heppel. I don't know who you're talking about. He goes, you're Martin Heppel. I went, mate, I don't know who you're talking about. I've never met the bloke before in my life. Yeah. He goes, you look like Martin Heppel. Will you, and he kept on pointing out, mate, I'm not Martin Heppel. He goes, will you tell him I'm back and I'm looking for him? I was like, no worries, mate. I don't know who you're talking about. So I grabbed now. I said, I'll tell you when we get home. Let's run like the wind. Went home, told mum and dad everything. And what I didn't know, I'm not saying this is right, um, but when it went around the first time, this is back in the 80s, all right? So this is like mm -hmm. in 1982 when it first happened. And what happened was that, the, you know, when the when the cops caught up with him, what, what I got told was that they took him out and got the yellow pages out and sort of said g'day to him, yeah? Yeah. Um, before everything else happened after that. So then I told mum and dad everything. Um, cops came around again, um, and then I didn't know what happened, but they obviously went and paid this bloke a visit again. Um, but yeah, you know, and then and then and that was done, right? So then, then I'm 31. I'm, I'm I've got three weeks left to go. My Melbourne University teaching degree. I'm at Melbourne University, and I walk in the boys' toilets, and there's a janitor in there cleaning them, and it's him. It's his head, his age, and I'll never forget the character. It's him, and I'm going. So as soon as I saw him, I was like, right, we're on it. Yeah, we are on. We're, it's going to go down, and it's going to go down differently to how it went down in 982. Because when that happened, yeah, I was seven, all right, and now I'm 31, all right. So and I saw him, and I'll never forget it. Like I was like, so I wore it, wore, had a backpack on, um, walked outside, put my backpack down. I, I, I even remember looking up for CCTV footage. You know, I was like. I don't want any witnesses for what's going to happen. I was waiting for no one to be in the toilets and, and no one to see me go in the toilets. And I started walking towards the door and then I stopped and I said to myself, mate, what are you doing, dude? It's done. It's over. It's over. Just walk away. So I turned around, got my push bike, and I rode home. And the reason why I'm okay with that, the reason why I can share that story with you right now in a heartbeat, no dramas, I don't care. Mate, everyone's going to listen to it, but no dramas, man. Mate, it can be, if people can walk up to me in the street and say that to me, I'm sweet, no problem. But the reason why I am okay, the reason why I've never lost an ounce of sleep is because when it went down, when I was in grade two, and when it went down when I was in year eight, I was so bloody lucky because before those moments, my mother and my father, they always spoke to me about their fuck-ups. They spoke to me about their failures. They spoke to me about the times when they were experiencing adversity. They made failure normal to me. And because they did that to me, I knew I could talk to them about my failures. Now, when I was in grade two, at that moment, that night, I did define it as failure because I was like, I can't believe I let this person do this to me. Now, I know I didn't fail, but at that moment, in that churn, I did. But even though I did define it as failure, I still told mum and dad. And because I still told mum and dad, 
and the cops, I got external help. And because I got external help, whether it be from a child psychologist or from the police or from my parents, from my mates, when I saw that bloke, it was done. I could walk away. Now, if I hadn't done anything about that, if I hadn't told my parents, I don't know, but sliding doors, sliding doors is a following. I don't yeah. do it about that and I go in there and I start belting him or whatever I wanted to do in my mind, yeah, because my emotions were out of control. Then once you have a criminal record, you can't teach. And, and I love teaching. Yeah. If I had a criminal record with three weeks left to go my primary school teaching degree, well then, mate, I don't know what would have went down. I don't know. So for me and for, for, for everyone listening, I suppose my message with that story, and I don't share that with kids, you know yeah, what I mean? My, my message to parents, to adults, to kids is the following, is talk about your failures. It's okay. It is okay. And if you can, you might just open the door for one of your mates to be able to talk to your mind. Like for people listening, they might have one of their best mates who's going through the churn right now, man. Might be experiencing some heavy duty shit and they don't want to talk about it because they're worried about what someone else will think because of judgment. We're getting better with it in terms of stigma, but there's a lot of stigma still out there about if you're going through some issues mentally, then you're weak and you're not weak. You're not inferior, you are unreal. It's just that particular moment you might benefit from some external support and we all need each other no one can do this alone and if you talk you will get help and if you talk you might then open the door for one of your mates to talk as well and if one of your mates was talking to you you tell me if you burn them you mate, will never burn your mates so beautifully said vulnerability really is a bridge isn't it yeah it's it's to connect. yeah and for us for us in this day and age we're getting better at it, but at the same time, we're really fearful, we're really worried about what else, someone else is thinking about us, man. Just yeah. let that go, man. Let that go. As I said at the very beginning, if you don't like the way I roll, I'm cool with it. Mm. But the people that I love, they do like the way I roll. Now, if I roll in a way that is not cool, then they will pull me up, and I hope they do, and then I've got to respond, yeah? Like this does not give me the right to be homophobic or to be racist or to not embrace diversity or to allow someone to identify themselves as they, she, him, their, whoever it may be. Everyone can identify themselves however they want to identify themselves to be. Bloody oath. And who the hell am I to tell someone that they can't? Yeah? That does not give me a right to be that, right, in my eyes. Yeah. I, but I've sure. got to keep being me. I've got to For keep sure. being me. Mate, it's so, so beautifully said. Honestly, like you just, the way you share this, the way that you're able to take what has been a challenge for you and so selflessly use it to serve others. Mate, I, I can't commend you enough for it. It's just such a beautiful, such no, a beautiful mate. gift to have. No, mate, it's, but it's, it's, as I said, it's like what I said before, I owe. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, it's, it's like little things like you and I never met before. You reach out on you know, LinkedIn, you send me a message and you talk to me about what you're charging for, what you're going for. And I'm yeah. like, this bloke seems like a good fella. I owe him. I'm not going to burn him, mate. Yeah, you know, yeah, we're yeah. hanging out today. It's an hour out of a day, an hour and a half out of my day, but you're a ripper. And so, like, it's just, it's, mate, it's, I, I, it's you cannot go through life and just think yeah. it's all about you. And it cannot be every decision that you make is all about you. Because if you do that, man, then sooner or later, guess what? It's just going to be you. There's mate, no one mate. else with you, man. Mate, You've burned percent. everyone. You've burned everyone. And then you tell me how much fun you're having sitting there, yeah, twiddling your thumbs with all the coin you got or the house you got or the car you got when you're on your own, dude. Like when I am 85, 160, whatever I am, I'll tell you what I'm going to be doing. I'm with all my mates, with all our false teeth, yeah? And we're going to be sitting there, and we probably can't remember what we did the previous day, and I'm probably going to be shitting my pants, not another <laughs> pants story for you, yeah? And I'll be yeah. sitting there with them, and we'll be doing long bowls or shish bish back down or whatever, and we're going to be talking shit. But guess what? We will be together. Mate, I that, love it. That's what it's about, man. 100%. Being together, man. A hundred percent. Mate, that's my dream. Mate, talk about being together. You're not going to believe this, right? I've got a little story for you. So I'm sitting here right now recording this with you at my mum's place. Yeah, unreal. And 
Right. So I'm at my mum's place because my mum is at work today. Yeah. And my partner's here. She's never heard me live on a podcast before. So she's just chilling on the lounge. And we've just like been cruising this morning, right? We went for a run. And she goes, your mum's not going to be home, is she? Because she's not met mum yet, right? She's like, I'm dressed like a dag. <laughs> and I said, no, of course not. Mum's just walked in the door. Yes. Hey, well, man, get, hey, get on your best behaviour, man. Get on your best hey, behaviour. Best behaviour. <laughs> mum, you're allowed to walk past. Nobody can see you on screen. Don't stress. Um, I think she, <laughs> mum thinks she's going to be live in the feed. So, mate, what a beautiful moment. You've just experienced a beautiful moment. <laughs> so you didn't even know it. There you go. I'll be, I'll, when you guys have 15 kids together, right, or whatever you want to do, um, just, and if you are going to have kids, do it, mate, but wait 300 years, man, at least 300 <laughs> years. It's unreal to wait. Yeah. But um, yeah. I'll be the one who says I was there when you when you met the in-laws. You know what I mean? When you met 100%. The <laughs> who was present? Martin Hevel was. Yeah. was. Yeah, I'm tipping um, your partners like, mm, not the bloke I'm going to be there, but anyway. Um, oh, mate, this podcast has had it all. Mate, I... Oh, before we dive into the five questions and answers, the last thing I want to go to is your work with the Resilience Project. It's made it so profound. Um, I've never had the opportunity of experiencing you live on stage, but I can't wait until I get that, you know, that opportunity because, mate, you're, you're so fantastic at what you do. I love the, I guess I love the contrast between yourself and Hugh. Um, yeah, there is. Different characters <laughs> and, yeah. um, but, you know, but both amazing at what you do and I have so much respect for the both of you. You know, you've obviously found your way into this work. Um, there is no, I guess there is no fluke to say that there is a reason that you are the only other person entrusted with that opportunity to get on stage for the Resilience Project. There is obviously um, a, a message, a beauty within your delivery that Hugh respects and and champions when you get on stage. When you're on stage, you know, what is the key thing that you're trying to drive home for these kids? When you're trying to drive home that conversation about resilience or when you're sitting in front of a group of adults and you're trying to drive home what the resilience project means, what that message embraces, um, if you could give us almost the elevator pitch on that or maybe even mm. a couple of stories to go with it, I'd love to hear. Yeah, no worries. So, I mean, I mean, it's a bit, I suppose, like, so it's positive psych. That's the evidence base that we, that we the strategies that we talk about. Um, we aim to give the kids, to adults, you know, elite sport, corporate, who is we're talking to, I suppose, opportunities to be aware of what they can do to be mentally, you know, healthy, mentally happy. Um, and, and not every day is going to be like that. But so we talk about the gratitude, the empathy, the kindness, the mindfulness. Um, so Martin Selman, Barbara Fricks, and they're the sort of, you know, Brene Brown's got elements. Some of you talked about vulnerability before. Um, so gratitude, focus on what you do have, not what you don't. Um, empathy being, you know, I, I'm not going through what you're going through, but you know what? If I can tap into that emotion, I'm more likely to yeah. do something kind. When you do something that's kind, the neuroscience link to that's massive with oxytocin. And then mindfulness is, I mean, there's so many bloody, you know, and, and people get argy bargy over it, but it's just about simplistically, I suppose, being wherever you are and knowing that your brain needs a rest, especially in this day yeah. and age. And then, and then it pivots to other things like, you know, and we've, I reckon what we've talked about today, you know, vulnerability, authentic connection, yeah. except you know, being imperfect, being flawed. But I think with the kids as well, it's about I encourage them to see what they've got, um, yeah. to be kind, to know that if they're having disruptive thoughts or experiencing anxiety, they're okay, they're normal, they're unreal. It would just be there's things that they could do at that moment in time. So exposing them to strategies, options to consider. And there's a plethora, there's a spread. So it's not just meditation. It's not just breathing techniques. It can be being in your flow state, doing something you're passionate about. It can be closing your eyes, then open them and identifying all the sounds you hear for 30 seconds. It could be doing puzzles, yeah? yeah. Doing yoga, origami, coloring in, it doesn't matter. It's and what works for you as an individual. And then uh, at, what I spoke about before is that, hey, at the end of the day, you're just going to be you. Just be you, and it's going to be hard sometimes, but go back to it. And then what I spoke about earlier as well is about just you got to talk. If you talk, you'll get help, and it's okay to talk, and it's going to hit the fan. And that's the, that's the hardest thing about trauma is that trauma is the external factor that no one saw coming. Like we didn't see COVID coming. No one saw COVID coming. Yeah. Yeah, you don't see it coming, and then all of a sudden, bang, you're, you're hitting the face, right? So everyone's got a different definition of trauma. I can't tell you what it is. I have no right, right? But um, 
it's if we're going through something big or small talk and then we get help and then you have belief that you can get through it yeah so we need to give the kids hope as well uh, we need adults to have hope yeah to be more optimistic to believe that there's going to be some good it's around the corner because that's when we persist so when we don't persist that's when we give up hope so that's basically you know what we do and you know we do that through storytelling um but it's i suppose it's about trying to have the listener empowered to um to to, to know that, that, that they're not alone and there's things they can do to support themselves mate i love that hope will heal the world um you know i've had plenty of hope in my life and it's led me to be in a place where um many people who were so-called experts never thought i'd be so Matt, i couldn't agree with you more mate, you said at the start when you talked about your parents walking out of the room man yeah what you believe is what you'll become i'm a mate. You, you dropped it at the very beginning yeah. yeah look at me dropping bars early on eh we love it it. mate i want to dive into five questions and answers with you for the people listening or watching this podcast they may know that 5q and 5a is a consistent theme at the end of every podcast um it is a part of the the closing tradition of the show but it's also released separately as a little i guess a little intro episode maybe you could call it a trailer for people who think would I like to hear Rack in full? And let me tell you, if you're listening to this, click out right now and listen to the bloody thing in full. But I'm going to run through that five Q and A. Um, they're consistent. I'm pretty sure I can remember all of them off the top of my head right now. Um, so let's flow, brother. The first yep. question is if you could recommend only one book or podcast to someone listening, what would it be? <laughs> well, I mean, here I do this with has written two books and does a podcast, so I reckon I'm stuffed when I'd say him. Um, <laughs> the Resilience Project, uh, Let Go, and also The Imperfects are good. But um, for me as well, other books, I, oh, I, I don't, um, I'm trying to think. I, 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 love, I love reading stories. Mm. You know, so I'm reading Flea at the moment. I'm loving that. Oh, yeah. da, um, Dave Grohl, reading that. Um, so for me, stories, the ones that have, but I know oh, another great book is Yohan Hari, Lost Connections. Yes. And yeah. Stolen Focus. They're probably two that, um, that are really good. This is, I mean, yeah, I love, I love reading stories. So they'd be the ones, but Hugh's written The Resilience Project and Let Go. Um, and The Imperfects is, is, um, is a podcast that's good as well. But in terms of podcasts, I'm not, I don't really, cause I, cause I, my gig is talking. Mm. presenting I, I tend to get in the car and just have nothing on and just be yeah. at this with my um thoughts and then um and then ring my mates and yeah. have a laugh so but yeah mate, and yeah and your podcast as well mate i'll start with mate, some, another I'll talk about what else <laughs> I, I will say i actually agree with you i'm i'm definitely a stories guy um have you read green lights matthew mcconaughey no have not mate you would Did love that I'll get on Especially it. your life experience, Borneo headhunting tribes. You'd love a bunch of the stories in that book. Cool. If you do anything, pick it up. And if you want to be absolutely serenaded, get the audio book. Mate, that bloke's voice is just out of this world. <laughs> um, my second question for you, is there an attribute that you're working at developing that you think has significantly improved the quality of your life? Yeah, I mean, mate, I, I am, I've got so many bloody flaws, so I, I've got to work on heaps. But I, one would be breathe before you talk. So, so like at home, something will happen or piss me off. And it's like, and at, in the moment, I've got to go there, man. And, and it's hard because for me, like, I can, I, feedback for me is like, if it's about a behaviour, it's okay. If it's personal, mate, it's wrong. So for me, um, it would be breathe before you talk because I can, I like, Jen gives me feedback and I'm like, yeah, no dramas, man. Hit me. Yeah, cool. Done. Whereas for her, I give her feedback and it's like, she's, and fair enough, she has to process it and she can't just go right done. So I need to breathe and then let go of the small things. Let go of the small I things. That. When the knife is in the fork drawer, just don't say a word, man. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Mate, I love that. Breathe and let go. Yeah. Um, the third question I have for you, which you've probably touched on at some point in the podcast here, but maybe there's something else that you want to draw to. What is the greatest challenge you've faced that's required the most growth to overcome? Um, oh, mate, there's, it's, it's life. It's, um, it's the unknown. It's the uncertainty. It's what I don't know what's going to happen in the future. It's, 
the trials and tribulations I reckon that my kids are going to go through and and I will not be in control. And that's going to be really tough. That will be the one in the future without doubt. So for me, it's anything where it's had a major impact on me, but I've been out of control. And then the uncertainty between not knowing and, and waiting to know, I think they're the moments where, where for me, that rock you and then for, and then it will be anything that happens to my mates, my family, my mum, my dad, my brother, his wife, his kids, my 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 Jen's family, you know, mum and dad, her brothers and sisters, and I, you know, and then their loved ones, their their partners, and then and their kids and and our kids. It's going to be when I can't, when I'm not in control. That's that's tough. Like yeah, I. I you know, any time one of my mates is going, I've had some mates going through some heavy, heavy stuff. You know, heavy stuff in the last year or two, and I'm like, it, it breaks you because you can't do anything to help them. You think, um, but if you keep turning up and being there for them, um, I suppose that's one way of getting through it with them as well. For sure, and I think that even just lends on even more so what the whole message of today is about. You know, developing that attribute of resilience and being being grateful having empathy having that mindfulness that when these things do come to pass that you know you know you've got what it takes to get through the other side so, yeah mate, beautifully yeah. said i think many people are feeling that that challenge and that struggle in their own lives the fourth question i have for you is is there a morning or evening ritual slash routine that sets your day up for success bloody oath man so my three kids and I, every morning we get up and we just go off tap. So we have, we have the tunes humming. And what are um, we talking? Give us some context. Oh, tunes. Mate, well, mate, I've got a seven, mate, it's a nightmare. It's, it's bloody, it's Encanto. You probably don't even know what that is. You no. don't know me, Bruno. No, 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 no. And then my five-year-old's found Barbie girl. You are kidding me. You know, I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world. And yep. then, then the playlist took him to, you won't remember this one, Macarena. Yeah, that. So that stuff kills me, mate. Not it's just, But it puts a smile on my kids' faces. And then Gordy, he's more into Queen. Thank God. Um, so the kids are loving Don't Stop Me Now and stuff like that. So every morning I, I know that music gives us positive emotions. So like for us in Melbourne during lockdown, we had, you know, a fair few days like you guys do, do in other parts of Australia. But I just knew, knew that I had to listen to music, I had to exercise and I had to laugh. So for me, every single day, there's music, there's exercise and there's laughter. And if I do that, I'm on. Mate, bloody hell, that's so well said. I love that. And it's funny, I was actually talking to one of my best mates. Listeners of the show will know Fernie quite well. And Fernie and I had a conversation about how one soundtrack every morning can just set the day on fire. Yeah, bloody love awesome. it. Yeah, love it. 100%. Great. Great answer. My last question, which is my favorite question of the five, is if you could share one message with the world and encourage everyone to act on it, to embrace it, to make it a part of their fabric and of who they are, what would that message be? I think it's what I've said throughout the whole um, chat is just be you. Um, but but with, it, with the proviso that you let others be there. Stand up for what you believe in. Look, so, so here's like, mate, I'll, I'll say it out loud. And, you know, if people disagree, I'm cool with that. But if I'm in the room with Donald Trump, it's on. All right? Like, oh, Sorry. But that yeah. bloke, he does not care about anyone else other than himself, and he tries to promote hate mm. for his own benefit. So what? So what I mean by that is, be you. But come on, man, you got to let other people be them as well. Mate, like, beautiful. Just let the let everyone be them. So it would be it would be just be come from your own skin. And, that, and the beauty of that is the following: is that when the journey to get into where you can be come from your own skin is tough, it's arduous, it's long, but when you get there, it's bliss, man. Cause then all you got to do is just wake up and be you. Mate, then you're cooking with gas. hundred percent, man. I love or it. Or induction in the future. We'll yes, see how we go. Very true. Very true. <laughs> Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm, um, I'm so grateful that you've taken the time. And as you said, um, that IOU philosophy, well, I feel very thankful for that philosophy of yours because I've been on the receiving end of that today. Um, I'm 
extremely grateful. I can't wait to share this with the many people who listen to and watch this show. Mate, you are a storyteller through and through. You're a man who should be listened to, um, whose advice should be acted on. And, mate, I feel very excited for your children, your wife, because they get this wisdom every day. Um, whilst at times they might bang their heads against the wall, mate. I know I think, <laughs> mate, you, you and I, there's there's parts of your characteristic and character that make us feel like two peas in a pod, mate, because I know my family would wish I shut up every once in a while. But, <laughs> mate, I, I feel very blessed to have had you on the show. Thank you so much, mate. And um, everywhere that people can find you through the Resilience Project, your LinkedIn, I'm going to put those um, links in the show notes here oh, today. Oh, mate, don't, don't mate. I'm not, yeah, you can if you want to. It doesn't face me. Like, I'm not after anything. So, mate, do what you want to do, but I'm not after anything, man. Mate, I appreciate the needs, it. The world needs to hear more Martin Heppel. So, they'll be there. Well, not everyone will agree with you. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, mate, mate, I, I can't thank you enough for your time, mate. And keep doing what you're doing. Keep enjoying the chats. And in terms of your own journey, mate, keep charging, man, because um, what you're doing is absolutely fantastic, mate. And you're, what you're doing is you're giving hope to so many other people and um, and you're allowing them to believe, man. So just keep letting people believe, dude. Keep at it. Mate, next time I'm in Melbourne, Melbourne magic on me. Leisure, mate. Appreciate your time. Man.